the issue of giving your last, let's talk about it first of all. Um, I believe very strongly, as a person of faith, has a strong found. I have a very strong found. I have three generations of faith, a powerful legacy of faith. I can tell you that um, faith, especially faith for finances, faith for partnership, is about three things. Number one, it's about um, conviction. Then it's about integrity. And then it's also about planning. Faith is always about faith for finances, faith for giving. It's about three things. Conviction. That's faith toward God that he can do over and above, exceeding abundantly all we can think or imagine. It's about integrity. That's a calculation of where you are, what's possible within your means, and what is true. Because you can be believing for something that's a lie. Because you know that your measure of faith is not commensurate with what you're saying in faith. That's a lie. The Bible says if anyone should prophesy, should prophesy according to the measure of faith. We get into a lot of integrity problems when we are using faith beyond the measure of faith that we have. You, you, now you're trying it toward IGOK and you've written platinum when... A rock, but you've not tried it on things that are life and death. When it gets to things that are life and death, you're careful to stay between your faith means. When you're sick and you know you don't have enough faith to believe God for natural healing, you go and buy medication and still pray on it because you know that your measure of faith is the type that can use both drugs and prayer to enter into healing. You don't take chances with your health, you don't sit down there until you die. Because you know that your work with God has not yet produced fruit. Your conviction level, your revelation level has not gotten there yet. When it does, you will. But now when it's time to give, you're happy to write platinum. Because it feels good to write platinum. An element that you may not even recognize if you saw it in the streets. <laughs> but you know that you know, all you have in your, your pocket are rocks. Pebbles. <laughs> I was just joking. <laughs> what I'm saying to us is that three things must combine. Conviction, deep conviction, built around personal revelation. It's not enough. If you go alone, if you go with conviction alone, you can produce a lie in the name of faith. You need conviction. Powerful. That's where all faith begins. All faith begins. Two, you need integrity. Some things are true. Some things are a, a complete blatant lie. About where you are, what you've spent before, what you've believed God before and gotten. If you've believed God for 10 million naira before and gotten it in very short notice, nobody's going to call you out for believing God for 10 million again. But you've only had God, you've only believed God for money to get you through a 15,000 naira debt. Then pastor preaches a powerful camel session and then you're believing for 4.5 4 million naira. David said, the same God that delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine, which means he measured the Philistine and the Philistine was not heavier than a lion and a bear. That's what he called faith. So we must start to combine these things. It's conviction, spiritual conviction. It must be personal in, with personal integrity, spiritual conviction, Personal in integrity and long planning. Calculated risks is what we call faith. Do we understand? If you put these three things together, you will never have a problem with giving. Number two issue, giving your last. The issue of giving your last. I believe that in your walk with God, God will call for your last one day. And it will not just be money. One day it will be money. Someday to be something else. And you will know that that is your last. When we make statements like give, even if it is your last, we are telling you that from a long history of working with God, we know that give your last is something God can say. God has said. He will probably say, very, say it to you very soon. In case this is your own day, please don't give much like the other people in the tabernacle, in the temple, and feel you give anything. 
Because Jesus is the only one that is authorized to look into the offering basket. And he will value the woman who gave a little, but was her last over the person who gave, the people who gave a lot, but they had a lot more left behind. So it's not a hard and fast rule. We're just saying that as you serve in the temple, in the presence of Jesus, your widow day will come. When your widow's might will be required by you from the Lord. And the Lord will be waiting to see that you gave it. It, 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 it can come anytime. But we, we say from the pulpit so that by the voice of men, it can register in your spirit that it's a possibility. All we don't do is, we don't start to manipulate you to give your last. No. We don't force you to give your last. But we make you know it is a spiritual possibility. It's something that can be required from you by the Holy Spirit and you're not supposed to rebuke the devil when you hear that voice. When you hear that, when you truly hear that voice, it's not the voice of the devil, it's the voice of God. The devil will never ask you to give your last to God. I'll say it again. And somebody needs to hear it. The devil will never ask you to give your last to God. So, but we can't tell what's going on, but we can tell you that in case that day is today, do not hide in your hearts. But please remember my rule about faith giving. Conviction, spiritual conviction, personal integrity, integrity, and calculated risk. For example, if you fail at it this year, you love the, the platinum idea for whatever reasons. Maybe you believe God has called you to be a financial um, um, support to the ministry or to be uh, a kingdom financier. And somehow you notice that based on everything that I said this year, you've missed it. The fact that you've missed it this year doesn't mean you've missed it next year. You know that another feast is coming. The date will be the third week in September. The theme is even ready. You will hear it at the conference. Everything is set for the feast. You can start to tell God. You, you mustn't localize all your faith to this particular event. You can tell the Lord, okay, what I, what I have this time, I will give. But in the name of Jesus, I'm going to start a procession. And I'll start to grow my faith. You heard that. Ajo. For those, of, for those of you listening online, <laughs> she made it worse. She said, ah, susu. <laughs> How do you explain it to the international community now? <laughs> the, uh, the piggy bank, um, uh, the ventures, and then the contribution. What do you call that thing when you rotate? The, uh, what's it in English? Yeah. <laughs> huh? Contribution. Rotational contribution. That, that um, for, uh, fund, uh, no, no, what do you call it? Uh, fundraising, um, uh, crowdfunding, thank you. <laughs> crowdfunding, okay? You have 12 months. Your faith can't die where you are. You have to combine all these three, and you'll be an incredible person of, of faith um, next year and, and in the years to come. Now, what would you do if you want to unburden but cannot? That's the last and the final one. Thank you, Prophet, for that question. Now, that question for the benefits of everybody. And it actually takes us into part of the, of the message that I was unable to, first, because of the time we did not have, and two, because that was not a teaching scenario. It was a pastoral service. But let me, let me tell you, if we were to go into that dimension of the conversation, you would, you would agree with me that although it is true that the camel must unburden at the foot of the needle's eye, it is not the camel's responsibility to unburden itself. Because the, the door that it has come to is a door of men. It is it, it's a door that clusters men. It is pedestrians that walk. He's supposed to cry for help. I have a burden on my back for which I don't have hands. To tear off. In fact, it must be men that confide it on me. So somebody too must tear it off my back. The same way it was knotted on me. So that was his opportunity to move from the questions he asked Jesus into petition. The cry for mercy. Until that hand comes and takes off of him the thing that he couldn't take off for himself. 
That was what he missed. He was sincere like anybody else. His, his question was sincere. He truly, if he was a liar, Jesus would have said it. Because when Jesus looked straight at him, he saw him the way he was in the spirit. He saw a camel. Everybody saw a rich, a rich young man. Jesus knew this was some camel that has been thirsty for a very long time. And wanted a new experience. But he missed it. And that's why the, the Archbishop of, of uh, the, um, of blessed memory, the host, I would say, there's only one prayer I know that can change things any day. And I don't care who you are. God, help me. God, help me. This is why you don't know what to say. Say, God, help me. We don't know how to pray. God, help me. You're on a crossroad. God, help me. Because there's something about the spirit realm. The prayer of mercy will never be turned back. It's the only prayer like that. There will be many reasons why many categories of prayers will not pass. But if you know anything about the courts, if it is true that Jesus died, anytime you cry mercy, there will be a response. And that's what he should have done. And so I'm saying to us, let's not get very lost in our worship, in our good questions, our intelligent conversations. Let's not get in the fact that we have run very far to come and meet Jesus. We've been serving this Jesus for donkey years or maybe camel years this time. And you know, we're the ones that came from a mighty long way. We had sighted him from afar off. Uh, when we get to the threshold where the things that he demands for us are beyond us, what are we supposed to do? cry for help. Amen. 